Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction there. Veteran, I'm only 50. I didn't fight in any wars. And I think that's, that's kind of disrespectful to our grandparents who did fight in the war. With my granddad, I have to take his word for it because in all the pictures he's wearing a balaclava. <laughs> right, this is a little poem for you, uh, Bliss and Abyss. We met, liked each other, and arranged to meet the next day. I go to bed alone but happy. I awake in the morning with anticipation. I think of the woman at regular intervals. I find myself not looking at other women today. My mind races away with romance. Happy thoughts flicker away. I'm a nicer person. I skip onto the future, dreaming of a time when we know each other, a time when we lean on each other, together forever, perhaps. I arrive punctual. She doesn't turn up. <laughs> If I see her again, I will not badmouth her. Instead, I will thank her for giving me several hours of bliss in abyss. Aww. Suckers! <laughs> <laughs> so I had 14 years of education in the Irish educational system. I'm dyslexic. They didn't spot that. Which I think is a massive fox pass. <laughs> I was born in London as well, and my dad, quite the prankster, he really was. Uh, for a start, I didn't realise I was left-handed until I was 19. <laughs> no, no, you're right-handed. I don't seem to be able to write with that. And, uh, but what he did is, this is a great prank, and I like the pranks where it takes a while. And what he did was, uh, at the age of five, we uh, moved to Dublin, and I had a Cockney accent. <laughs> and this is the height of the Troubles, 1970. <laughs> Very popular kid. Like Tommy Steele comes to school. All right, how you doing? Hey, don't look. Knees up, Martha Brown. Knees up. <laughs> Just get beaten up all the time. Event I became so Irish, and I was going to school with a balaclava, you know, tin whistle, iron jumper, pint of Guinness. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to knock anyone's religion, but if you do believe in heaven and hell, you're a child. <laughs> that was something your parents did to scare you when you were a kid. You're going to hell. I know, burning. People go to India to find themselves. I was going to do that. Got as far as Bristol and gave up. <laughs> I was doing some shows in Bristol. You know where Bristol is. It's lovely, the pretty houses painted. And uh, like I, don't, I had to do two nights there. And I don't like not being at home. Because I'm up at 6 o'clock in the morning. And I can't go, Bristol, get up. Start doing stuff for me. And uh, I looked up the, you know, you know, the travel thing and find out what's happening in Bristol. Second biggest attraction was the Coulson Suspension Bridge because it was built by Brunel. And uh, I went there and it's just a bridge <laughs> with cars going over it. And I'm going, well, that'll kill five minutes of the day. That's brilliant. <laughs> but weirdly, uh, there's a gift shop on it, like a tiny little one. So I thought that'll kill another five minutes. Went in there and they're pretty much selling like pictures of Brunel and fudge because uh, that's one of the rules of life, isn't it? <laughs> Every gift shop has to sell fudge and say it's from that area. You could get up to the top of Everest and be a little gift shop going, do you want some Everest fudge? <laughs> Probably do it with a sugar boost, yeah? Do you want it? Yeah. My granddad used to say to me, uh, in times of crisis, Sean, you should make your own fudge. And I thought it was like a kind of proverb, like as in, you know, don't rely on other people. All the ingredients for fudge are in your house. Don't rely on outsiders. And like that thing where you occasionally believe in God. If you make your own fudge, you wouldn't feel like that. You just know there wasn't a God and you're self-reliant. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> you know. But that's what I thought he meant, but apparently he just like fudge. <laughs> He's a bit lazy about making it himself. <laughs> I should have known it wasn't kind of something funky he was saying, because the last thing he actually said to me was, is Boy George a man or a woman? <laughs> So anyway, I kind of, uh, so I went, I went into this gift shop, right, and Beryl's working there. She's a name badge on, that's how I know her name. And what I like to do in life is, because I do get bored really quickly, is have fun with people, as in say the most ridiculous things with a straight face to see how they react to it. And actually, here's your goodie bag tonight, folks. Here's two tricks you can play on your friends, right? One is a friend of mine rang me up recently. He went, um, oh, I've just been to the sex clinic, and they said they've got chlamydia. And I went, let me take off speakerphone, yeah? <laughs> Have that next time someone tells you something 
of a crisis. That's for you, a little gift to take home with you. The other one, a bit more site specific, is um, if you're ever a passenger in a car late at night, sneakily get your phone out, put it on photo mode, take a picture, the flash goes off, you go, oh, I think you've just been done. <laughs> You're already on nine points, aren't you? That's you not driving for a year. <laughs> <laughs> but so, um, so I know Banksy's from Bristol, so I just went up to Beryl really straight face and went, did uh, Banksy paint this bridge? <laughs> <laughs> she was looking at me like going, what are you talking about? And, but then, weirdly, she was such a sweet soul, Beryl was, she got a map of Bristol out on a pen and started highlighting where all Banksy's murals were. And I, was in, I had to live the lie now, I had to pretend I really liked Banksy. <laughs> and I'm there going, oh, and I take the second roundabout there and just <laughs> and I go left and it's about four streets into that, yeah. And, but she was so helpful, and after 20 minutes I said, Beryl, you've been so helpful, thank you very much. And she turned to me and said, oh, that's not my name, I couldn't find my name badge this morning. <laughs> Who does that? <laughs> Where's Beryl? Get her on the phone. I don't care if she's poorly. I want to talk to her. Went to uh, Rwanda. Not for the genocide, my friend. Not for the genocide. <laughs> I went trekking uh, mountain gorillas. Has anyone done that? Oh man, it's the coolest thing ever, isn't it? Honestly, like it costs 800 pounds as well to spend an hour with the gorillas, but I love gorillas. And uh, I said, I'm doing that. And um, I didn't like just go over for an hour. <laughs> you know, go, what are you after this afternoon? Rwanda. <laughs> Put me a uh, dinner in the oven, I'll have it when I get back. I did the safari thing, but I love gorillas. I like animals, but you know, when you know you're gonna see mountain gorillas, you see a giraffe and go, yeah, long neck, big deal. <laughs> Oh, yeah, the lion's eating the antelope. <laughs> so I, and I did it, and it was cool. They said, be at this location at 7 o'clock in the morning. I went, cool, I'm up at that time, no problem. And I got there, and it's just a little hot. I went, I think I've been ripped off. I think this is a scam. And sure enough, 7 o'clock, he opened the hut, and I bought some fudge off him. Um, <laughs> and you're only allowed up in groups of eight, and there was nine of us there. And he just goes, uh, uh, well, there's nine of you here. One of you can't come up. And he says, who's in couples? And they were all in couples because, you know, they live by society's sour rules. And he said to me, I can't come up. And I go, but I'm a maverick, <laughs> very lonely maverick. And, uh, and I said, oh, so I was fifth here. What about the queuing system we have in, in, in Ireland? And he went, uh, we're a French Connolly. We, he kissed me. And uh, we had dinner a couple of nights later. A bit garlicky, but it was good company. And then he said, look, relax, there's a German group coming in a minute, you can go up with them, you'll have a right or a laugh. <laughs> he hadn't travelled. And so, she, but they didn't turn up, which is weird for Germans, and so I got to go up on my own. How, I went up to see the gorillas on my own. When I say on my own, I didn't say, yeah, off you go. A, a trekker goes ahead of you. Gorillas move a kilometre a day, so he kind of pretty much knows where they're going to be around. So he goes up ahead, and I went up with two armed French soldiers, because they're still quite volatile there as well. And, uh, and I'm hung over because I'm on holiday. And you know when you're hung over in a different culture, the hangover is twice as bad. And, I'm, and I can't speak French. So, but anyway, and they're there, and I can't understand the word they're saying, they're just going, you put the you put And all that, because I'm hung over, all I think they're saying is, let's take his wallet <laughs> and throw him off the mountain. <laughs> Accidents happen. <laughs> and so I'm there. And then the tracker goes, I found, I found the gorillas. And uh, this is, you know, we all have a fun part of our job. He goes, right, before you see the gorillas, two things. One is you're not allowed to touch them in case you give them disease. They're nearly extinct. And I think, you're not looking too perky yourself, my friend. <laughs> and then he says, this is where he, he tries to keep his uh, laughter. And he goes, and this is true, he goes, right, just to let you know, if one of the infants gets between you and the silverback, the silverback will run at you. Uh, beg, 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 beg your pardon? He will run at you, but relax, he will stop a foot away. He's just warning you not to touch his children. King Kong <laughs> is going to run at me, and I stand my ground. 
Yeah. I said, how do most people react when you tell them this? A lot of people throw up. <laughs> a lot of people run away. And uh, so we got up there and we were just... And also, folks, this is the thing, right, you know? I have these memories for the rest of my life. All those other seven people took pictures for the hour, <laughs> ruining their experience. Don't do that. You know, I have those memories for... Obviously, I asked them for th the pictures afterwards, but... <laughs> and we're there, right? And... Um, and then the trekker notices there's three big apes behind us, and he doesn't like that. He likes it where we're kind of not right there, and they look quite evil. And he, to appease the gorillas, starts making this noise. He goes, ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> But then the three of them came by us, and it was so beautiful, and he just said, stand still. But then one of the gorillas touched me, just on the back above my knee. You know, it wasn't a spiritual thing. It was pretty much like, wait. You're next on the pool table. <laughs> but I will never forget that touch, especially the six weeks I was in the hospital with rabies. <laughs> so it was, um, it was New Year's Eve as well, and it was the 10th anniversary of the genocide. And the Italian couple were staying in the same uh, place as I was. I was going to say ranch, but uh, fucking ranch, a lodge. <laughs> But I said, so do you want to meet for uh, a drink for uh, New Year's Eve? And they went, yeah, yeah, we'll see you down there at quarter to midnight. I said, I'll be down there about three. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, quarter to midnight comes and they t turn up and I go, I'll get some champagne. So I went up to the barman and I went, uh, some champagne, please. And he went, this is Rwanda. You will have local beer. <laughs> and, um, and then at five to midnight, the president of Rwanda comes on the television and he does this really stirring speech about it is 10 years now since we have a peace Let's just keep this up. We have reconciliation in our country. We will get on together. And the barman is so entranced by this, he starts crying. The uh, reason I'm telling you this story, right, is I don't come out of this well at all. But <laughs> so at five to midnight, he's crying. And he turns to me and he just goes, uh, my mother, my father, my brother, and my sisters all died in the genocide, but I do not want revenge. I want peace in my country. And it was such a moving speech, but I'm there kind of looking at my watch going, uh, the beers? <laughs> <laughs> Nearly midnight, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, so kind of, as I say, 50 and... Uh, like, I, I, people say, why did you start drinking and smoking again? Because I thought, and I thought, because they're the only things in life I actually like. You know, cause I, and also, like, you know, I didn't mind being the sober one at a party. Can you imagine going to a party where everyone is sober? That would last three, four minutes before you go, this is tedious, I'm off to the off license. <laughs> But I'm unfortunately, like, I know it's so easy to you know, generalise and say Irish people drink too much. We do. You know, we do indeed. It's part of our culture. And, uh, but it's like also, I'm working class. So it's that weird thing of uh, when I started doing TV and stuff, I used to get a lot, invited to a lot of parties that had free bars. And you know what it's like if you're working class and free drink. <laughs> it's just no stopping, isn't it? Just, all this is free. <laughs> All night. <laughs> like, I don't, I'm, I'm happy to make 70, mainly. Like, I don't want to be 120 in a nursing home and people are going, are you enjoying your 120th birthday, Mr. Hughes? Blink if you are. <laughs> What's blink for turn off this machine? <laughs> and who's Mr. Hughes? I tried to, I tried to do that thing. I went where I live. Uh, the local gym was doing a free week's trial, and I think you've heard the buzzword there, free. <laughs> and I went, I'm having some of that. And so, because uh, I've got a long day anyway, since I'm up so early, so I went to the gym quite early in the morning. So I did that thing, got on the uh, rowing machine for 15 minutes, tedious. Bicycle for 15 minutes, tedious. Treadmill, tedious. Like you can't walk. Then lifted weights for 15 minutes, tedious. And then the uh, trainer came over and says, do you need any help, any questions? I went, yeah, all this uh, exercise I'm doing, is this creating energy, like electricity somewhere? Is there a family in Crumlin now <laughs> having a hot meal because I'm doing this? Because otherwise this is pointless. <laughs> but yeah, so 
I thought I'll go the next morning. Did I go to the gym the next day, my friend? No, I went to the physio. Because <laughs> I could not walk. And I went to the physio and I, I was on my belly and she's put an acupuncture into my back. And I said, what seems to be the problem? And she said, you've uh, traumatized one of your muscles in your back. And I said, what are you talking about? She says, well, you're, you're 50, you live in land, your rowing muscle wasn't really expected to get the look in. <laughs> What? What? No, don't! Don't row! <laughs> My cat died last year as well, and um, it's all right, it's all right. Death happens, relax, folks. Um, and um, basically, if there's any vets here, uh, you ought to be ashamed of yourself because uh, it's a very corrupt industry. <laughs> um, the vet school is four years training, three years how to look after animals, a year how to keep a straight face when you tell people the price of tablets. <laughs> so I took my cat down to uh, be put down in the vets and uh, 90 quid. And, uh, and I was in tears, not because the cat was dying, but 90 <laughs> quid to do one injection. And then they do that classic, uh, do you want us to look after the body? We can give a, a really good send off. We can do that for uh, 245 pounds. <laughs> I said, oh, I'll do it myself, thank you very much. <laughs> so I buried uh, Maggie in the back garden. The only tip I was told is bury them deep, otherwise a fox will, you know, dig it up. And uh, I was having my breakfast the next day, boiled eggs since you asked, my friend. I don't know why he wants to know, but there you go. <laughs> and uh, I looked to where Maggie used to be, and I realised I was never going to see her again. And I had this weird sensation where my chest tightened. And I went, oh my God, this is what heartbreak actually feels like. And I went, no, that's your digging a cat grave muscle going, what were you thinking of? <laughs> what were you thinking of? So I'll do uh, one more poem and then uh, one more story. And then that's us done, my friends. Aww. Right. Uh, <coughs> death. <laughs> I want to be cremated, I know how boring funerals can be. I want people to gather, meet new people, have a laugh, a dance, meet a loved one. I want people to have free drink all night. I want people to patch together half-truths. I want people to contradict each other. I want them to say, I didn't know him, but cheers. I want my parents there adding more pain to their life. <laughs> I want to have my ashes scattered in a bar on the floor, mingled with sawdust, a bar where beautiful, trendy people will trample over me again. <laughs> I like being 50, and uh, I tell you why, because I can look back on my youth now and realise the mistakes I made, and it's okay that we make mistakes, it actually is okay, but I can now pinpoint the moment in my life when I realised I was drinking too much. I was 25, and uh, I just wished Mumbo Jumbo and Common Sense got together in a ceasefire kind of vibe, and just went, it's getting out of control, come on, let's go on this one together but they didn't I just finished doing Sean's show and uh, I had the cure on Sean's show so I became friends with the singer Robert Smith he rang me up one day and says hey Sean we're down in Bath in Jane Seymour's house recording the new album do you want to come down for the weekend I'm in my car <laughs> how cool is that so I went down to Bath and uh, they, they, Robert Smith doesn't do drugs uh, the rest of the band do and he turns a blind eye to it and I hung out with the blind eyes that night I tell you <laughs> So midnight comes, I am trashed, but you know you get your... Irish people are used to getting second, third, fourth wins. Usually the fifth win is, shall we have a proper drink? <laughs> <laughs> so, but midnight comes and I'm trashed. And Robert Smith comes up to me and goes, because Cure kind of that band that kind of they sleep all day and record through the night. And Robert Smith says to me, we're going into the studio, Sean, you want to come in and help us record? And uh, I'm thinking, I don't know how to play any musical instrument. <laughs> So I'm that pissed, I think I, I went... Instrument! <laughs> and I said, yeah, fine. So I went in there, I find myself drunk with a bass around me, playing this bass. I'm that drunk, I think I wrote that song of Forest. <laughs> I'm there, and I'm having the time of my life just jamming away with the cure, and then four o'clock in the morning comes, and Robert Smith comes up to me and says, hey, Sean, shall me and you go out and watch the sunrise together. And, uh, and he drinks brandy. 
I can't stand any spirits like that, but, you know, he's Robert Smith, so I'm drinking brandy as well. So we have two brandies, and we're sitting on this bench, just watching the sun come up, and I left out one minor detail. He also brought out a mandolin. Robert Smith started singing Cure songs to me, serenading me with Cure songs. I'm thinking, this is the best day of my life. This is a close second. I'm thinking this is something, I haven't got grandchildren, but it's the kind of thing I want to tell your grandchildren about. <laughs> and I'm just having the time of my life, and he's just singing these songs to me, and I just go, how lucky can a person be in life to have such a lovely moment happen? And I think it's, I'm not pissed, I think it's in the middle of love cats. I turned to Robert Smith and went, I'm off to bed. <laughs> So I'm very proud to be Irish. I've never been so more proud when I was uh, asked. Uh, I was at the Flower Festival in Finsbury Park. Anyone been? Right, it's radio. People can't see you when you're <laughs> waving like that. Unbelievable. But yeah, I, w <laughs> I was at the Flower Festival in Finsbury Park in London, and uh, I was at the side of the stage, and a friend who organised it said, Christy Moore was about to come on, and he says, uh, could you introduce Christy Moore? And I went, sure, Christy, this is Alfie. <laughs> and uh, he went, from the stage, you idiot. <laughs> So I went out, and there's 60,000 drunken Irish people all there. It's the only festival you get breathalyzed before you go in. You go, no, mate, you haven't had enough yet. <laughs> get those six cans in you. And so I went out, right, 60,000 drunken Irish people. And I just went, anyone in from across the water? And they went ballistic. They were throwing pigs up in the air. They were just going <laughs> mad, going, yeah, Ireland, Ireland, Ireland. And then I just went, bonjour. <laughs> Yeah, I've never seen so 60,000 people going, mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you very much, folks. You've been absolutely adorable. I'll see you again soon.